Welcome to the IVF Journey with Dr. Michael Chapman, the podcast for couples who struggle with infertility and want to fulfill their dreams of becoming parents. In this podcast, you'll learn actionable strategies to deal with infertility from Dr. Michael Chapman, or Prof as he's affectionately known. Prof is the co-founder of IVF Australia and is a leading Australian infertility specialist who has helped over 3,000 couples realize their dreams of becoming parents. To access previous episodes packed with ideas, solutions and tips that actually work, head over to Dr. Chapman's IVF podcast on iTunes. You can also ask questions by contacting Dr. Chapman's rooms on 1800 111 483 or by emailing him michael.chapman at ivf.com.au. That first cry of a baby born after the long journey of IVF remains one of the most beautiful experiences in the world. As an obstetrician and an IVF specialist, I've had the privilege of experiencing this over many thousands of times in my long career, but I still remain moved by each baby's first cry. It signifies the end of a long journey and the beginning of a new life. This is Professor Michael Chapman, co-founder of IVF Australia and host of the IVF Journey podcast. Thanks for tuning in. To access all the previous episodes, head over to my website, www.theivfjourney.com and select IVF Journey Podcast from the navigation menu. You'll also be able to find the various services that we provide at IVF Australia. So, welcome back. And today what we'll do is run through a few questions that I've been asked over time. They're pretty standard FAQs and perhaps we'll start. The first question is, can IVF be successful with a low AMH? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. Low AMHs actually reflect the numbers of eggs. It doesn't reflect the quality of the eggs. So even if you only get one or two eggs because you've got a low ovarian reserve, If the quality is good, then you'll be as successful as somebody that's got a high AMH. Usually this relates to age. So a low AMH when you're 35, if you get eggs out, and you will, but you may only get two or three, the chances of one of those eggs being a good one is as good as someone with a high AMH. What AMH does tell us, though, is that if it's relatively low, that uh, you shouldn't be putting off having a baby for three, two or three or four years because you may well run out of eggs by then. Next question, can IVF be successful with low sperm counts? Well, 25 years ago, after I'd already been in IVF for 10 years, I would have been saying not so good a result with low counts Because we need for natural fertilisation to occur in the laboratory, we need 50,000 swimming sperm to put in with the egg in the dish. If we didn't get those sorts of numbers, then chances of success were low. And then along came ICSI, intracytous plasmic sperm injection. And then what that meant is that we could take a single sperm and inject it into the egg and produce fertilisation in 70% of eggs, which is basically the same as natural fertilisation. There are still debates as to which is better, IVF on its own or with ICSI. Some people think we overuse ICSI, but really the pregnancy rates are within one or two percentage points. And it's only when you have reasonably large studies that a statistical difference has been noted. But then, of course... We're starting with poor sperm, so it's not totally surprising. Next question. Can IVF be successful with fibroids? Again, the answer is absolutely yes. Fibroids really only play a part if they interfere with the cavity of the uterus and cause failure to implant. So yes, if you have fibroids that interfere with the cavity of the uh, uterus, then that can lower IVF success rates and increased miscarriage rates. So those are the ones we tend to treat. Fibroids, however, are common. 30% of women have them, 
and the majority of those who then have babies have no problems whatsoever with spontaneous conception or if they are IVF pregnancies, if they're on the outside of the uterus or in the wall of the uterus, they also will generally be successful pregnancies. Moving right along, can IVF be successful with blocked tubes? And the answer is absolutely yes. That's how IVF came into being. It was specifically to uh, get round women who had blocked tubes due to infection or endometriosis. So the first pregnancy was a woman with blocked tubes back in 1978. So by taking the eggs and bypassing the tubes, fertilizing the eggs in the laboratory and putting the, the embryo back into the uterus, we were able to create an ongoing pregnancy. Obviously IVF is used for a lot more reasons than that now, but it is the classic reason why IVF became useful. Someone's asked me about low egg numbers. So can IVF be successful with one egg? And the answer to that is absolutely. It depends on the quality of that egg. And I've had a number of patients who, to some extent, we express disappointment when after stimulation with the drugs and ending up with only one egg, we got were extremely concerned that we wouldn't get a pregnancy. With one egg, we can go through the odds. I mean, they're not as good as if you've got lots of eggs, but one egg still can be a baby. So each egg that a woman produces that is mature has about a 70% chance of being fertilized if the husband's sperm is good. So that's we've already lost 30% who obviously won't get pregnant because we won't have an embryo to put back. Of those eggs that fertilize, about one in three of those so we're now back to 30%, we'll actually get to the stage of a blastocyst. But once you get to that stage, that pregnancy, that blastocyst has as much chance as any other blastocyst when there were lots of eggs to create a pregnancy. So yes, overall the odds are less, but it still can happen. And if that's all that your ovaries are going to produce for us, despite our medication, it's well worth going ahead. Sometimes on a first cycle, when we can't really judge what dose of medication is best for you in terms of stimulating eggs, we may only get one follicle and we may cancel the cycle on the basis that perhaps we could do better. And by increasing the dose of drugs, we very often get more eggs the next time. If, however, on a second cycle we still only got one egg, then I would certainly be talking to patients about going forward with the full knowledge that the odds are less but are certainly way above zero. I've been asked about adenomyosis. Can IVF be successful with adenomyosis? Yes, it can be. It depends on the severity of the adenomyosis, how much of the uterus it's actually taking up. Adenomyosis is like endometriosis, except it's in the wall of the uterus. And being there, it can impact on the uterus, on the uterine lining, and therefore does reduce the chances of success. But I've certainly had patients conceive despite it. Oh, here's a question that I'm often asked, and I'm probably not asked, I'm usually told by our patients they're doing it. And what they're doing is acupuncture because they've read about it, somebody else has had it and they got pregnant. But the biggest study of using acupuncture in IVF, which was published last year from an Australian group, which I was one of the, the uh, providers of patients and one of the scientific coordinators, showed that it did not change IVF success rates. So... Scientifically, there probably isn't good evidence that acupuncture helps. That's obviously not what an acupuncturist is going to tell you, nor the naturopath, but the science is there. While our study was the biggest, there have been multiple other studies looking at acupuncture in randomized small trials and lumped together a analysis of all of those trials still come up with the same answer, that it doesn't work. There are one or two studies that suggest that it may be helpful, but when you do 20 studies, it's not unusual for one or two of them 
to have the opposing answer. But going with the majority and also the biggest study ever done, I would say be recommending the patients that acupuncture in terms of improving success rates makes no difference. Now it may uh, give a better sense of well-being and aid you through the process of IVF because certainly it can be relaxing. But I think that's all it does. I'm totally unconvinced that it improves the chances of having a baby. I suppose going along with that, and I mentioned relaxation. Another question that I often get asked is whether stress can affect IVF success. My normal reaction to that when patients ask me is to indicate that it probably makes a tiny difference. And I mean, there are many pregnancies conceived in nature when people are incredibly stressed in situations where most people are lucky to be alive and they then (laughs) conceive. So I'm not totally convinced it's the major thing. And the problem with IVF is it creates stress. And I've talked before about those stresses and strains that come with the desire to have a baby, the way in which IVF makes people anxious of whether it's going to work or not. And so there is always stress with IVF I am not, however, convinced it makes a very big difference if we could get rid of the stress. And I certainly wouldn't put people off having IVF who are in a stressed situation. So what does improve the success of IVF? Well, technology keeps moving forward. And the more we understand the processes, the science of fertilization and implantation, the more likely we are to produce better pregnancies. There's new equipment being designed all the time to improve the chances of picking the best embryo to put back. At IVF Australia, we've recently employed artificial intelligence across all of our sites. We use time-lapse photography and using the images, we can look at the embryos and the computer program that goes with the artificial intelligence can actually select the embryo that's most likely to be the one to produce a pregnancy. And it seems it does better than even the best skilled embryologist. So there's an advance there of the last six months that we're able to offer. So success in IVF still comes back to the basics. If you're 30 to 35, that's the best time to be successful. Over 40, success rates drop off dramatically and science has yet to improve those. So success, for whatever reason causing your infertility, ultimately age is going to determine your chances of success. So I enjoy answering questions and in fact they prompt me to talk about things that you want to know about. So feel free to send in any questions. You've got my email and I'll answer them. It may not be immediately, but I'll certainly air them on this program on a regular basis. So ask me questions. And don't forget that you can access all the previous episodes by going to our website www.theivfjourney.com and select IVF Journey Podcast from the navigation menu. Thank you for listening to The IVF Journey with Dr. Michael Chapman, the podcast which helps couples negotiate their way through the IVF journey all the way to parenthood. You can also ask questions by contacting Dr. Chapman's rooms on 1800 111 483 or by emailing him michael.chapman at ivf.com.au. 